MySQL is very different from other database servers and its architectural characteristics make it useful for a wide range of purposes. Although it's not perfect, it is flexible enough to work well in very demanding environments. For example, web applications, data warehouse, content indexing, highly available and redundant systems, online transaction processing and much more. To get the most from MySQL, we need to understand its design so that we can work with it and not against it. MySQL's most unusual and important feature is its storage engine architecture whose design separates query processing and other server tasks from data storage and retrieval. If you need to get high performance from your MySQL server, one of the best ways to invest your time is in learning how MySQL optimizes and executes queries. Once you understand this, much of the query optimization is a matter of reasoning from core principles and query optimization becomes a very logical process. Here's the flow MySQL follows when we send a query to the server. First, the client sends the SQL statement to the server. Prior to MySQL version 8, the server used to have the query cache, but this was removed for performance reasons, which will be discussed in another section. Then, the server parses, preprocess and authorizes the SQL statement and the result of this is a parse tree. The optimizer turns the parse tree into a full query execution plan. The executor takes the query plan and makes a call to the storage engine API. Finally, the server sends the results back to the client. Each step takes time and may itself be a complex operation consisting of several subparts, which we'll discuss in the following sections. MySQL Server can be divided into three layers. The first layer contains the services that aren't unique to MySQL, connection handling, authentication, security, and so forth. Client-server architecture and most of the network-based tools need these services. The client-server protocol makes MySQL communication simple and fast, but it limits it in some ways too. For one thing, it means there is no flow control. Once one side sends a message, the other side must fetch the entire message before responding. When the server responds, the client has to receive the entire result set. This is why limit clauses are so important. Now, if we are using libraries to connect to MySQL, we should be aware that the default behavior for most libraries is to fetch the whole result and buffer it in memory. This is important because until all the rows have been fetched, MySQL server will not release the logs and other resources required by the query. The query will be in ascending data state. The advantage is that when the client library fetches the results all at once, it reduces the amount of work the server needs to do. The server can finish and clean up the query as quickly as possible. Here, most client libraries let you treat the result set as though you're fetching it from the server, although in fact you're fetching it from the buffer in the library's memory. This works fine most of the time, but it's not a good idea for huge result sets that might take a long time to fetch and use a lot of memory. You can use less memory and start working on the results sooner if you instruct the library not to buffer the results. However, the downside is that the logs and other resources on the server will remain open while your application is interacting with the library. To begin, Let's consider a simple query. After the connection is handled, MySQL parser breaks the query into tokens and builds a parse tree from them. The parser uses SQL grammar to interpret and validate the query. For example, for mistakes such as coded strings that aren't terminated or checking that table columns exist. Next, the preprocessor checks privileges. This is normally very fast unless your server has a large number of privileges. The second layer is where things get interesting. Much of MySQL brain is here, including the code for query analysis, optimization, and all the built-in functions for dates, math operation, encryption, and so forth. Any functionality provided across storage engines lives at this level. By the way, the goal of this section is not trying to document MySQL internals, 
but simply to understand how MySQL executes queries so that we can write better ones. To begin, the rewrite component will write again the query if necessary based on some rules stored in MySQL. For example, if we execute a query against a view, the system rewrites the query in order to access the base table instead. The parse tree is now valid and ready for the optimizer to turn it into a query execution plan. A query can be executed in many different ways and produce the same results. So, optimizer's job is to find the best option. MySQL uses an optimizer that is based on calculating the cost of each path. This means that it tries to predict the cost of various execution plans and it chooses the least expensive. The numbers are actually estimates based on statistics. For example, the number of pages per table or index, the cardinality, that is, the number of distinct values of the indexes, the length of the rows and keys, and the key distribution. Nonetheless, the optimizer might not always choose the best plan for many reasons. The statistics could be wrong since the server relies on storage engine to provide statistics and they can range from exactly correct to wildly inaccurate. For example, the InnoDB storage engine doesn't maintain accurate statistics about the number of rows in a table because of its MVCC architecture. We'll cover later the concurrency control topic. Also, the cost metric is not exactly equivalent to the true cost of running the query. It might be more or less expensive than MySQL's approximation. For example, when MySQL doesn't understand which pages are on operating system memory and which pages are on disk, it doesn't really know how much I.O. the query will cause. Additionally, you probably want the fastest execution time. But MySQL doesn't really try to make queries fast. It tries to minimize their cost. Last, the optimizer can't always estimate every possible execution plan. So, it might miss an optimal plan. On a more positive side, MySQL knows how to do a lot of optimization on its own. For example, reordering joins, converting joins, applying algebraic equivalence rules, optimization for count, optimization for finding the minimum and maximum values, subquery optimization, and so on. Of course, as smart as the optimizer is, there are times when it doesn't give the best results. Sometimes you might know something about the data that the optimizer doesn't. If you know the optimizer isn't giving a good result and you know why, you can help it. Some of the options are to add a hint to the query, rewrite the query, redesign your schema or add indexes as we'll see in future sections. As mentioned, the output after the parsing and optimizing stages is a query execution plan. This in turn is used by MySQL Query Execution Engine to process the query. In contrast to the optimization stage, the execution stage is usually not all that complex. MySQL simply follows the instructions given in the query execution plan. Many of the operations in the plan invoke methods implemented by the storage engine interface, also known as the handler API. The final step in executing a query is to reply to the client. Even the queries that don't return a result set still reply to the client connection with information about the query, such as how many rows were affected. The third layer contains the storage engines. They are responsible for storing and retrieving all data stored in MySQL. They are implemented as plugins, which makes it relatively easy to switch the way to handle the data. The main storage engine, and the only one that will be considered in this guide, is InnoDB. This is fully transactional and has very good support for high concurrency workloads. An example of another storage engine is NDB Cluster, which is also transactional and is used as part of MySQL NDB Cluster. There are many different engines for many different use cases. However, InnoDB is the default storage engine for MySQL and the most important and broadly useful engine overall. You should use InnoDB for your tables unless you have a very compelling need to use a different engine. 
If you want to study storage engines, it is also well worth your time to study InnoDB in depth to learn as much as you can about it, rather than studying all storage engines equally. InnoDB is a general purpose storage engine that balances high reliability and high performance and it was designed for processing many short-lived transactions. We will talk about how InnoDB organizes the data once we talk about the clustered indexes in a later section. Now, the optimizer doesn't really care what storage engine a particular table uses. Still, the storage engine does affect how the server optimizes the query. For example, the optimizer asks the storage engine about some of its capabilities and the cost for certain operations and for statistics on the table data. In query tuning, the most important steps are the optimizer and the execution steps, including the storage engine. Most of the information in this guide relates to these two parts, either directly or indirectly. MySQL has a layered architecture with query execution on top and storage engines underneath. The goal of this section was to understand how MySQL executes queries so that we can write better ones based on educated decisions. Executing a query includes several steps from which the optimizer and the execution steps are the most important and are the ones that we will learn more about in later sections.